Welcome back to the Latin Rouge Cycling Podcast for the best day of cycling I have ever watched with ups and downs, turns, dominance, weakness, just all out racing for the best part of four hours. Insane stage, 151k stage 11 from Albertville to Col de Granon. It featured over 4,500 metres of climbing, much of it over 2,000 metres. Uh, flat first 40 Ks, um, apparently I'm not allowed to say tug buddy anymore, uh, where you need a ruler helping you in the break. Uh, then there's the Lasse de Montvernier, 3.5 Ks, 8% before a false flat uphill to the Col du Telegraph, Col du Glibier uh, combination, which is 12 Ks, 7%, short 5 K descent, then the 17.6 K, 6.8% climb to Glibier, which is a souvenir Henri de Grange, the highest point of this year's race, 2,630 meters before a very fast descent and false flat descent to the base of Col du Granon, which hasn't been used for the best part of 30 or 40 years, I don't think, 11.5 Ks, 9.1%, unrelenting gradient to 24 100 meters as a reminder of the GC standings before the stage. After the Mejev stage, Jonas was 39 seconds behind Taddy Pagacha, Thomas on 117, Yates on 125, Godu 138, Bade 139, Mars 150, Quintana 213, Roglic all the way back on 252. And we had a cyclocross start, Benji, like an actual <laughs> one, like off the, off the neutral. Exactly. The two riders you'd expect in a cyclocross uh, thing as well. Wout van Aert and Van Der Poel going with both of them in the breakaway. And you're starting to ask, well, Van Der Poel, what is he going to do in the breakaway here? Like, is he just taking extra steps to be ahead so that he can lose more time over time so he doesn't go OTL by the end of the stage out of the time limit? No clue. But Wout van Aert was clearly an indicator that he would be in the breakaway either for the green jersey points, which is already kind of secure. So I was guessing more to be a satellite rider for Jumbo Visma for the latter parts of this race. And it took a while for a second group to form behind because I felt like Ineos was kind of like countering any big group that tried to bridge towards Wout van Aert and Van Der Poel. And those groups included the likes of Benoit. So yeah. Jumbo trying to get multiple riders in there. And then later Laporte. What, what do you think was the thought process behind Ineos doing that? It was kind of like the reverse of what Yumbo did to them on, was it Mejev yesterday? Yeah. And I was like, shouldn't you be trying to slip Castro and Van Balen here? And then you've got, and it's not just as an aggressive thing. Sometimes you need a satellite rider defensively. If your rider's dropped and he's trying to chase on a fast flowing descent, you can have Van Baal wait for, say Thomas is ahead, he can't drop back, but Yates is 20 seconds behind, you can drop him back. So I was yep. surprised they weren't getting on board, but I don't know. Again, Pidcock, I think they were just in survival mode today. But yeah, those cyclo the cyclocrosses, <laughs> Van Aert and Van Der Poel went in that <laughs> breakaway. And if you want a taste of riding in the mountains, like Granon, like the Galibier, Zwift has you covered with the epic KOM, Alp de Zwift and Ventop climbs, thanks to its combination of fantasy and real world riding destinations. Zwift can give you that. Also, it's just really good preparation, particularly for me, like, Arcalis, Ordino, called Ordino on my back doorstep, but sometimes it's good on Swift. I can put in, and it's just like get the fan on, dial it down to the yeah. exact what's I want to do, and it's good for my actual confidence, Benji. Um, before going on, going outdoors for those big climbs, do you have the same sort of thing? I think for me, it's been a, a more general weight loss journey. Going on Zwift, I've lost 17 plus kilos now in the last like seven, eight months. So it's what been crazy. Fuck? And I've gained like loads of self-confidence because That's of so it. Good. So I'm so happy about that habit being uh, added to my life for certain. Anyway, if you want to try Zwift, you can hop into the LRCP Zwift Club to stay in the loop with me and Benji. Benji, as he said, he's absolutely crushing it on Zwift this year. It's crazy. And he's really, really consistent. Head to Zwift.com to find out more or to start your free seven-day trial. But yeah, they went in that move, Wabana and MVDP. It turned out MVDP abandoned. He got dropped on that last de Montvernier. <laughs> and I don't know. Like, it's a bit... It was almost like he was, was a last-ditch attempt to run himself into form. Yeah. It helped Van Aert a lot. But yeah, it's, it's weird, Benji, to get in the break, get dropped from the break, and then abandon. 
Yeah, it feels like it was Loki that Wout van just took his phone yesterday evening and was like, let me call Mathieu van der Poel. Mate, can you help me out here? I've got an issue. I, I need to get in the brakes. I need to get a bit of a tugboat into the breakaway. <laughs> and I ended up getting it from Mathieu van der Poel. That's how I saw it. But you said it. La de Mont Vernier, smaller climb before we get to the uh, Telegraph climb. And we've got two Yumbo riders in there, Christophe Laporte van Aert, Cherel also in there, Paul at Schachman, so Schachman with a tugboat. Bajoli, Cataneo, Geschke, Izagire, Gradek, Turns, Vanderpool, who was then dropped and abandoned, Van Kersbulk, Ruch, Bargill, Pedersen, Galopin, Bodnar, Latour, and Nylans. But if you see that group, like, it's a large group, and UAE is not the team that can control much in this race let's be honest about it they've got limited riders one of them has positive for COVID and still riding his bike which is Micah and then you see that they've got Hirschi pacing to keep the gap at roughly seven eight minutes going into that La Sede Mont Vernier Hirschi's off the back of that peloton at the foot of that climb Bjerg takes over Bjerg's pacing for half the climb is gone then and then they're down to three riders Soler McNulty and Micah while in the front, Laporte is dropping from the front group together with plenty of people because Bonard was on fire today. Like, at that point in the race, he was riding. Was it to keep the gap significant or what was the goal? So it was clear that Yumbo wanted to have a satellite rider after Galibier. They wanted Wout after Galibier. It seemed like their first preference was Benoit, but Alperson... Again, some teams, it's a, maybe a, a podcast discussion topic for the off-season... Little, lack a little bit of subtlety in allowing a break to form. When there's two riders ahead on a stage like this, the other teams will not stop jumping until they are represented. So you have to let the right move go, whereas Alperson guys were just trying to shut it, shut it, shut it. And that ended up bringing the Peloton closer to WoW and MVP. But yeah, Laporte's in there, not the note. So Laporte just had to pull and it was just going to be WoW afterwards. And yeah, I think UAE Benji... Like, what can you do, really? Like, I de- in an ideal world, if I'm mm. UAE, I set SkyTrain, not like full gas, but enough so that Wout doesn't get over Galibier ahead. Um, can and, they, though? And, and I don't think they, they, they can't. They can't. Like, they're pacing with Björg on Telegraph. Yeah, and he's gone halfway Telegraph already. So there's the one pacing from that point on to the top of Telegraph. So it was clearly not ideal there, but... It wasn't you know, going to come from UAE, the pacing for the entire Telegraph and so forth, because like we said, Yumbo's planning something, and we saw it on the Telegraph already. I Honestly, before this stage, I would have never expected a move on the Telegraph already, and perhaps that's a mistake on my end for not anticipating that. I expected the Roglic move on the Galibier, for example, but Benoit launched with Roglic in his wheel past the UAE terrain, about, was it two and a half to three kilometers from the top of Telegraph? Yeah, it was like... It had not been a furious pace, and they just did like a lead out for it was like a Nicola Ede lead out for Quintana in February. And I was like, and at this point, you can talk all you want about UAE, all oh, the Bjergs at the back, here she's dropped, Mike is not there. But bagatch has got a completely full gas tank. He sat in the wheels for 40Ks flat and then done the telegraph at Mikael Bjerg's pace in the wheels. He's fully fresh. And Rog tried a couple of times. That didn't work. Pogacar. Should Pog have closed him down, Benji? Uh-huh. That's the, because we look at it, I look at it one way. I'm like, the Roglic attack there is pointless because he's three minutes behind. Pog has three teammates and he should just get them to chase Roglic. But it's not stupid because you got to play the man. Pogacar burns a match halfway up the, the telegraph. Exactly, but it's two ways, you know. I think that we're also like discussing this with a bit of hindsight knowledge of what will eventually come at the end of this stage, but there's two scenarios here. Either you chase down Roglic and you make sure that he can't link up with Wout van Aert in the future in that stage, or you let him go and he's able to link up perhaps with Wout van Aert. You've got your UAE train, but then you're kind of dependent on your UAE train. And I feel like Pogacar has shown significantly that he's not trusting his teammates to close gaps that much. So, worst case scenario, let's say that his team can't close the gap to Roglic. Roglic gains time one minute, two minutes on the Galibier, for example, and bridges up to Wout van Aert. He's going to have to pace himself in the Valley eventually at that pace. So, I think despite him burning a match, that it could have turned out worse in the Valley already if he hadn't. 
maybe, yeah, maybe if Roglic had it, we didn't know at that point whether Roglic had it or not. Yeah. Um. So, but from all appearances, there's been whispers Roglic is feeling okay. You know, you you saw on Kovadonga, Roglic can go long. He paced himself in a valley and then dropped Bernal on Kovadonga. He did like six six point one for thirty five after a long attack half solo. So, yeah. It's it's interesting. I did not expect Yumbo Visma to start that early. Um, yep. I basically was my idea was just pace hard and launch Jonas um, because I thought Jonas was superior. And then the top of have we spoken about Benji now? This situation where Roglic attacks over the crest. Nope, not yet. We have Thomas, Jonas, Roglic, Pagacha. Kus and Kreuzweig have not pulled at all. Soler's behind. Well, and technically, it's... technically, Kus and Kreuzweig were behind for a bit. Roglic makes that move at the top of Telegraph, links up with Laporte, who was dropped from that uh, breakaway, yes. and they're there with five riders for a bit. And that's the skirmish that happens between the top of Telegraph and basically halfway Galibier. And it's interesting, you know, because... Laporte's not going to last too long, we know that. And what happens when Laporte is off that black, of the front of that group? Roglic has to go, eh? Once again, tries to roll attacks, you know? I thought they should have waited, actually. Um, mm-hmm. The first five kilometers is 2 to 3% of Galibier, and Jonas and Roglic were counterattacking Pagacha on the flat. They were chasing the moto when it would go past, just one twoing him over and over and over and over and over. And... I don't know, maybe it did make a difference in the end. I'm not sure. Um, because I was like, oh, just wait for the Coos and Cross like behind set furious mm-hmm. pace on Galibier and then attack with Roglic at the end of Galibier too wow. Well. Um, that was sort of what I thought. But Og was getting stressed, Benji. You could tell he was <laughs> looking back multiple times. He's on the radio, where are you? And it actually caused Soler to sort of panic bridge to him when Verona was pacing them back. Exactly. That Solaire bridge happened when it was not only Verona. I think DSM was playing a role and for Bardet, maybe? for example. You're right. FDG was there with, I think, Maduas and another yeah. teammate for Godu. So Stora. three respect teams. Respect on Australia. Okay, respect on Stora. You're right. I'm very sorry, Australia. The kangaroos, I love you. But um, when it comes to that group, we had Solaire trying to bridge towards the group that still had Thomas, Jonas, and Roglic up there. And he actually succeeds in that. But then Roglic makes like this small move and Soler drops again and Soler is back. It was so funny. I didn't know what was happening at that point, what the point was of that Roglic move. But I just want to say in general, while yes, it's a very risky tactic for Jonas and Primoz to do these rolling attacks on the flatter parts of the Galibier, but this is some of the best cycling I've seen in my entire life. That wasn't, I was looking at that and I was like, oh, dad, come watch, come watch. I loved it. I loved it. It was crazy with hours left in the stage before they'd even started the proper Galibier <laughs> climb. They're attacking each other. Absolutely mental. Like, I just couldn't couldn't believe what I was seeing. And then eventually Roglic stops. Galibier starts. It's actually Soler pacing. Soler again was good. Uh, and then Benoit is trying to start to set pace. But is he quicker than Soler? What are Yumbo trying to do? Eventually... I've almost forgot what happened on the Galibier, Benji. Um, did they? Okay. <laughs> you tell, basically, you tell me. Basically, eventually, there's a regroupment, like you say, with the likes of Beno, the likes with Gaz, the likes with Kreisweg, joining up with those riders that we just spoke about. That is Jonas, Primos, and also Pogacar and Thomas. So those riders link up with all those domestics of Yambo. Only two riders of UAE are left in that group. That is McNulty, who is hanging on at the back for for trying to survive and Soler who bridged up earlier so his entire bridge was useless in hindsight but he couldn't know that of course but after that we see that Micah's like in the back like 20 seconds behind the group together with Louis Mankis Louis Mankis trying to bridge back Micah probably trying to bridge back himself but Micah's in the wheel so that's kind of the scenario we're in going into uh the Galibier and I'm starting to notice that we've got I think Kreisweg starts to pace, or Kustra starts to pace. One of the two starts to pace. Perhaps Benoit was even the first one of the three to start pacing. Benoit probably. was first, yeah. And the tempo goes up, causing McNulty to drop at the back and Soler to drop. And when that happens, you see five Yumbo riders with Thomas and with Pogacar. And I've probably like Yates was there still. I'm not sure about that. Bardet probably. But 
it's such a situation where the strength of Jumbo Visma at this point in the race was so intense compared to Pogacar, but it would switch so quickly. I know. Because Pogacar moved to the front, and one by one the Jumbo riders were dropping in. What was your thought process through that? So Pogacar was... He he had decided during this stage he was going to close every Rog every Roglic move. <laughs> yeah. And so he, once they dropped one, well, he dropped Roglic off the pacing, and so he just kept it going because he he would he was obviously sick of being one twoed and counted. Um, and so he was like, I'm going to just pace the entirety of the Galibier because Roglic is too. You know, in hindsight, it doesn't look very smart actually to pace the entirety of Galibier because Roglic might be there. And Roglic was going backwards fast too, Benji. Roglic is dropped by Yates, Bardet, Thomas. He's in, he's almost nowhere. He's with Godou, I think. And it's just eventually Thomas loses the wheel off Pogaccia's pacing. Uh, but the counter-argument to that is Pogaccia can set a tempo he's comfortable with. He knows Wout Van Aert's ahead. Wout Van Aert... Um, he didn't wait at the top. I, I don't know what Wout was doing, actually. Uh, he, yeah. he didn't wait he at the did top. A, he did a bike change at the top, and then he went the steep parts of the first part of the descent, and then he took a piss in some corner, and then he started slowly descending, waiting on the group. So Yeah, but if just... Jonas gets five seconds on Pog, <laughs> Pog will catch him on the descent before yeah. he catches Wout. I don't understand what he's doing, um, yeah. frankly. and that, It's... I I blame the team more than Wout for that mistake for not waiting on time there. Okay. No, it doesn't matter in the end. That part doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> I think Foggy definitely, yeah, didn't want Jonas to attack him. The question was, Benji, though, why is he pacing so hard on Galibier to drop Thomas Yates and co when he, he has no teammate, uh, teammate ahead? Probably. He's not going to pace the entire valley yeah, is it just, like, why? Or, like, I don't... It, we're 2020 hindsight now, but why is he pacing that hard on Goulibier? My guess is that Roglic was behind at that point and he still had the fear of Roglic, that he wanted to, like, put the dent in the... the nail in the coffin of Roglic, for example, or Thomas and those competitors. And he also, like, did his elbow to let Jonas take over, but there's no situation there where Jonas should pace for Pogacar, so... It was a worthy attempt by Pogacar to get Jonas pacing there, but good decision by Jonas not to do anything. But I was kind of surprised that Jonas did not attack by the top. I, I was like, oh, is he, is he feeling something that he might not have the day he expected? Because otherwise I'd expect him to make that move with Wout van Aert ahead. But eventually they cross the top together. Nothing happens. Wout van Aert is a bit ahead. Roglic in a group behind to get away, I think, Grupama and so forth. There's riders in between, Thomas, Quintana, and so forth. And we get a bit of a status quo. Finally, a pissing break for me because, oh, my bladder was dying this entire Galibier. But um, then Wout van Aert starts waiting, but a bit much, eh? Well, what happens is Ineos get two with Jonas and Pogacar. Kuz comes back, Kreuzweig comes back in dribs and drabs. They eventually catch Wout, and they realize FDJ are pacing Godou back with Roglic and Mika in the group, and the UAE car, I think, is back there. Not entirely okay. sure, but I'm pretty sure. And so Wout, we've got Bargui up the road, Paul Bargui. He took the uh, souvenir Henry de Grange. I, we haven't mentioned him enough, but he didn't end up winning, so F in the chat for Warren Bargui. Um he was doing the false light down here solo and the GC group wasn't getting time because they're all finessing. I thought this Benji was why Dylan Van Baal or Castro needed to be in the break where Adam Yates or Thomas can counter and try and slip away on this section ahead of Pagacha, but with no teammate ahead, you cannot pace the valley alone. So that's where Ineos really missed a satellite rider today when they had two guys in a group of five Yeah. Uh, at that point. Anyway, Wout goes back to get the Roglic group. And I'm like, you're bringing back a UA domestique and the car. And to be honest, Roglic just got like a minute 30 put into him on Galibier. I know he's attacked a million times, but is it worth it? Like what's Roglic going to do? Um, for you on Grenoble. I guess he could do a bait attack and maybe get Pogaccio to close it. I'm not sure. Um, to be, It didn't really influence the stage. Uh, no, that's not true. It did influence the stage a lot. Mm -hmm. At the time, Benji, I don't know, because what's the alternative? 
Wow just paces the front and Jonas and Pagacha get to sit in the wheels? Like, what benefit do Jumbo get from that? Honestly, I thought that Roglic didn't have much left at that point. Like, we've never had a history where Roglic kind of falls through the eyes and then kind of comes back later and resurrects by the end of the stage, for example. I, I don't, at least don't remember something like that. So I wasn't expecting him to be very useful there. And I honestly... I have to be honest, Micah was in that group. I was surprised that Micah was the UAE domestique still in that group and still alive because he was dropped earlier on the Galibier by two other UAE domestiques. So I was shocked to see him there. Like He's literally COVID positive <laughs> as well, <laughs> poor guy. I got to be honest, if I'm... Personally, I, w- I wasn't even thinking about potentially waiting for Roglic at that point in any case. But... If I put myself in the situation in that car and I know that Roglic is behind together with Micah, I'm weighing the options like, is Roglic going to be better than Micah as a domestique here? And at that point in the race, I would have probably said yes. I uh, Yeah, I wouldn't have waited with WoW, but in the end, it actually really played into Yumbo's hands for reasons we didn't expect. They drive it to Grenoble, WoW catches that group, he then begins pacing into the base of Grenoble, that ruins Warren Bargui's chances of winning the stage, poor guy. Um, he'd been <laughs> out there, I think, where did he end up coming? 10th. Um, but yeah, he needed a big head start before Grenoble. If these guys were going to launch it, we see Pagacha on the TV smiling at the camera. And I presume he'd taken time to drink and refuel. Like, it was a long time before end of Galibier to base Grenoble. And he smiled at the camera. And he's like, does the um, throttle motion, saying it's been full gas all day. To be honest, I was getting a little bit depressed because <laughs> I was about to become um, an exposed <laughs> flat earther. And I'm like, this guy is going <laughs> to nuke everybody on Grenoble. I was losing a bit of faith. Because Galibier was really impressive performance. Really, really, yep. really impressive. But it's the gradient he prefers, I think. Um, a little bit more in his wheelhouse. They get to Grenoble. But no, who, uh, was Benoit there? No, so, uh, maybe he was. Anyway. It was Jumbo- Van Aert. And then I think Roglic was ahead of Kuz. I didn't see much from Benoit anymore at Grenoble. No, he but he's there. done a I lot lied. before already. I lied. It was Wout Van Aert leading them to the base. Roglic does like a two-second, five-second pull, (laughs) insta-drops. He did, Micah had to accelerate to close him. Micah then starts pulling. Kuz comes up, does a five-second pull, insta-drops. Kreisvike does the same thing, drops. And suddenly, we have a group (laughs) of Micah, Pagacha, Jonas, Barde, Thomas, Yates. Gadu dropped pretty shortly on Grenon. And we're thinking, Ineos have numbers. Are they going to play numbers? Now Jonas is isolated. UAE can completely dictate the tempo of this climb. And we got to tell. Quintana attacked after his teammate Buggy. In hindsight, completely defensible attack. Buggy was being caught. What Quintana did, completely defensible. Just didn't, the optics weren't great chasing his own teammate up the road. And a French one at that, going for the stage win on Grenoble. And we see Pog get on the radio after Micah begins accelerating. And I think he told him to dial it down a little yep. bit. And a couple of things tell that to me. They were not gaining on Bargui very fast. They did not put Thomas or Yates under any further pressure or Bardet, uh, the pacing of Micah. The, and Bargui was ruined. Like, this guy's been in the break all day, yeah. and they're not gaining fast. Quintana goes out to 40 seconds in a few kilometers. And I'm like, Mike is not pacing that hard. If Pog wanted to end the TD, we, we know if Pogaccio feels good, what is the golden rule? He attacks. Yeah. He always attacks, and he will attack at 5Ks, and he will try and kill the TDF today. If he feels good, we know that's what he would do. And yet Mike is pacing backwards at this point. And so Bardet attacks Benji, no reaction. Yeah. And it, that's the point where I knew Jonas will have to try him. Exactly. We saw that Bogacha for the first time in a very long time was trusting the domestique he had with him, the same domestique that dropped earlier on the Telegraph already. Like... That, to me, showed this is the moment, Jonas. Push those fucking pedals hard because you're getting away from Pogacar on this climb because Pogacar always trusts himself over his domestiques. 
he always responds himself. And yeah, Bardet is not the right of that. He must respond to 100%. He would, but though. He would. He would. You're right. He's not that and far behind on GC. Exactly. And which is great after the Giro abandonment, by the way. Bardet's Shout out. On one. To He's on one. Love it. But that was the moment where I was like, okay, Jonas, this is your day. And it was weird because, like, at what point did he attack? Was it 4.5k to go? I'll do the I will do the honest attack. This is the moment I've been waiting for for a very long time. <laughs> Micah pacing and Jonas hits him with it. Not in the six kilometer section to go. It was a bit later in the end of the steep section. Jonas attacks. Pagacha does not get out of Micah's wheel. And we knew the prophecy was foretold. Does not get out of the saddle. Micah actually gaps Pagacha in his in his response. And then Jonas sees he's got a gap and just absolutely hits it. I think I saw a graphic from the Tour de France or Radio Tour or something that Jonas took like 30 seconds in a kilometer. I, I we not said, surprised. Von 2, Jonas took 40 seconds in four minutes. Okay, so he can take time very quickly and Pagacha can crack very badly. And that's what happened. I did not expect this though. Uh, Jonas going clear, full, like, <laughs> he was going fast, um, like scary fast, goes past Barté like he's not moving, goes past Quintana like he's practicing a different sport and just absolutely destroys Pagacha on the Grenon. And um, turn down your little headphones. Fair warning this time. You're the flat earthers! You're the flat earthers! You all <laughs> thought the earth was flat. Everyone's like, Pagacha's untouchable. And I don't want to hear about, oh, Pog might have COVID. Okay, what, he contracted COVID between the Galibier ascent and Grenon? <laughs> like, he looked pretty good <laughs> on Grenon and, like, wouldn't have been the way exactly I drew it up. It ended up Micah being the pacer for Jonas and he showed, like, the watts per kilo graphs were not wrong. Soleil like, <laughs> I, I started to doubt myself in them, but they weren't wrong. Like, Jonas did it, and Jumbo Visma did it. The tour isn't over, but, man, it, it feels good to be... Like, right, I, thought, I thought I was insane, Benji. On the Glibier, I, I thought I have to... I'm going to go, I don't know, be an Andorran tobacco farmer. I was going <laughs> to shut it down. I could have points. I, was, I, I did lose a bit of faith, but, yeah. Yeah, but... The thing with data is data's right as long as the pattern is consistent and data can evolve over time where one data point can switch it around. And it's always possible that this becomes a scenario where Pogacar proves everybody wrong, that proves the data wrong because cycling data is not like we haven't seen Pogacar on 20, 40 plus minute climbs in races. So the data is limited where we base our opinions on, but if there is a pattern, that pattern exists until the pattern is not there anymore. For now, in my opinion, the pattern is still there when it comes to Pogacar. He's showing weakness once again on a long climb. Relatively hot conditions, in my opinion, because I'm sweating my ass off in this podcast already. So I can imagine what those riders were doing on a 30-degree uh, bottom of the climb. So, ah, like, it happened. Pogacar was dropped by Yona. It's not by 30 seconds. It's not by a minute. The time went up and up and up. And riders kept passing Pogacar left and right. David go do drop Pogacar. And... That's when I start feeling bad for Pogacar. And that's I where I'm like, I, I, I do because... It's hubris. He thought he was <laughs> invincible. What? He, Pogacar thought he was invincible. Why is he closing ROG Telegraph? Why is he, like, burning his team on stage nine, on, sta on other stages? And I, I think he knew that Jonas was going to drop him today. And Benji... I thought Pogaccio would lose, I said, 40 to 60 seconds. That still would have shocked people. I, the, the reason Pogaccio got dropped, he lost 2 minutes 51 today, plus 10 bonus. The reason he got dropped that badly was because of the way the stage played out before and how he rode it. Um, so credit to Jumbo Visma. But Jonas goes on to win one of the most historic stage wins ever, like shocking the world, dropping Pog. 59 seconds ahead of Quintana, who, as I said, has moved right up into fifth on GC. Bardet third on 110, Thomas on 138, Gudu on 204, Yates on 210, 
Pagacha 251. Lutschenko actually unreal today, 338. Don't know where that's come from. Christ like ninth on 359. Paul Warren Buggy 416. Mass lost eight minutes today. Pitcock oh, oh, 10. Oh. And Roglic just rode in, I think, with Koos to be honest, on 11. That's good for Pitcock. Is that wrong? No, it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I'm he was happy pacing himself a fair bit. So, yeah. Good. He, he can get in a break later. Thomas. Geraint Tom, like, Geraint Thomas, masterful performance today. Not closing gaps when Rog Pog and Jonas were all fighting, just sitting on, playing out of it. He got not really any help from any of his teammates, to be honest. And then he paced. This is what Thomas is also good at. Paced the climb perfectly and being able to Grant Thomas dropping Taddy Pagacha by a minute, <laughs> a minute 23, unreal on a 9% 11K climb. Um, I think Thomas was on Bardet's level or ahead of him. I think Bardet got that buffer because he attacked before Thomas and Thomas had to wait. Um, so, but yeah, I think cr- crazy stage, crazy finish. I couldn't believe it because three minutes. Like, Pagacha completely capitulated on the climb. Exactly. And, like, the Tour de France is never over. This is the perfect example of that. This is even, a like, a closer example because it was only 39 seconds and people are already shouting that the Tour de France was over and Pagacha was unbeatable. But it's never over until we're actually at stage 21 rolling onto the Champs-Élysées. Stuff can happen left and right. Stages can evolve. And this were the two key stages. Stage one right now of the key stages. Stage two tomorrow. Oh. I can't wait to see what happens tomorrow, and I hope that Pogacar can strike back in one of the stages to show that he's not out of the game, because I'd love to have this this 1v1 this entire Tour de France, because that'd be amazing. Amazing. This sport is amazing. But it's not 1v1 anymore. That's the thing. Like, GC now is turned on its head, with Jonas 216 ahead of Bardet, DSM looking solid enough. Pagacha on 222. Thomas is now four seconds off the podium on 226. And Yates is on 306, about uh, 44 seconds behind Pagacha. Quintana on 237. So I think, I don't know. I don't, I don't think DSM or Ineos also want to let Pagacha just go up the road either, Benji. Yeah, I think so as well. It's going to be... um. Like, it's going to be impossible to preview GC the coming day in the last, like, 10 minutes of this podcast based on what can happen on the stage tomorrow, looking at each team and so forth, because there's so many factors that we'll be thinking about, like, what will Ineos be thinking now? What positions do they think they can fight for, knowing that Pogacar has shown weakness on the climb like today? What do they now expect when it comes to, well, Roglic is out of the game, basically, 11 minutes down, he's folding into a domestique role. Like... All these riders are now fighting for two positions on the podium instead of one. Or do you think that Pogacar will still be better than a Bardet, than a Thomas and so forth when we get across the Alps tomorrow and go back to the Pyrenees? Yeah, like, are we sure that Roman Bardet was really stronger than Pogacar today as a whole yeah. across the stage? I'm not convinced of that. And nothing we've yeah. seen, that I just don't think that's the case. I still Agreed. think, like... <laughs> The start, the work Pagacha had to do on, like Pagacha rode a completely insane race in like a, I was in awe, in awe. I was like, this guy is incredible. Closing down one, two attacks over and over on uphill, downhill, like then pacing the whole Galibier himself. It, it did eventually cost him, but like Bardet ain't, and Thomas are not that level. They rode steady all day and got the best out of themselves time-wise. Um, but we now have, a very interesting situation this year's Tour de France. As you said, Benji, with Yumbo clearly have only having one leader, defending yellow is now a completely different kettle of fish. We also have the final TT. We have plenty of bonus seconds available where Pagatch has shown he can beat Jonas in every single sprint. And so 222 is not out of it by any stretch of the imagination. If we know anything about Taddy Pogacar, when he loses time, he comes back the next day and he fights back. Stage 7, 2020 Tour de France, the next day he attacked on Col de Paris Sud, took back 40 seconds. So this isn't over. And the final TT, you have to expect Pogacar to take a minute. 
you have to, I know that's a yep. lot, but you have to expect a minute, maybe yep. even 90. That's how I would game ah, plan. A minute. I a minute, 90. yeah. 90 is complete it collapse, but <laughs> it's a long TT. You don't know what can happen yeah. either. Um, so I think Thomas will eventually get Bardet. Well, Thomas is virtually ahead of Bardet with the TT by like two minutes, right? Uh, like Bardet is a pretty uh, terrible time trollist. We know that. I just love his aggressiveness in races, so that might get him an advantage at some point in the coming future. His aggressiveness that Thomas might be more defensive to respond to, but they're both climbing amazing. I, I'm just looking forward to the upcoming stages, and I think that brings us to the next one, right? But he also wants to love the West. Another big one, the second of these Queen stages in the Alps. Big one. Galibier again, but this is the ruler side, 23Ks, 5%. It's not as hard as the side they did today. Then they descend the side they do today with the Telegraph descent. Then they do the Col de la Croix de Fer, 29 kilometers, 5.2%. But the final ramp, uh, like the climbing, for example, it's like 5.5Ks, 9%, and then a flat section, and then the last 5 kilometers are all 8%. Step descent, flat valley. And then Alpe d'Huez, 14Ks, 8% with a flat finish. Alpe d'Huez, uh, it's another 35-minute climb, 40-minute climb. It's steeper at the bottom. I do think it's um, I think it's pretty close between Jonas and Pagatra on Alpe d'Huez, actually. There's uh, Grenoble I, I preferred for Jonas, a little bit steeper. Um, the problem for UAE, Benji, is what is Pog just has to wait for the last climb. Like, he can't... I don't see how Pagatch's team, when Yumbo yeah. like Yumbo, have to transition to defensive mode now, right? Or do they need to pace Skytrain on Alp and try and get Jonas to drop Pog again? I've already seen people suggest Roglic in the breakaway at the start of the stage. No, but no, no. Come they're on. ahead. I, I'd go defensive mode, and I'd see if now I'd go Skytrain, and I'd see if that gives extra damage on Alp S because. The way Jonas Vingegaard climbed today, that way he should be able to take time again tomorrow. As simple as that. They've got the best team to control, and they don't need to try anything special for that. Play defensively, Jonas' final climb, boom, beam, bomb, and they've got potentially another uh, another stage here. Should they let the breakaway win? It depends of who on who's in it. They, yes. I think they know that if someone has 20 minutes, the closest in the breakaway, the break should win. They can't control anything else anyway. And yeah. That's my take on that. Play it offensively and simple like that. The problem for Poggy is he can't, I don't think, how, how's he going to get a teammate in the break? Like as a satellite <laughs> rider, like that ain't that ain't happening. Here she. <laughs> yeah, poor here she. I feel bad for here she. Like late yeah. notice, clearly not in good health um, here. But yeah, like Benji, Pog can't attack on the top of Cold La Croix Affair. Like his team is... Like, Micah was great today compared yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, Micah and Sule can set up. I'm not saying he... I'm, no, no, sorry. I'm yeah. not saying they can't set up an attack. I'm saying he then would have to do a 40-kilometer step descent and, and valley and then the whole climb himself. Now, yeah. he tried on Perisud, but that was a climb. I, was a just, I think descent straight into the finish. There wasn't a valley after Perisud yeah, when correct. it took time. So, and then stage eight, the teen, it was back-to-back -back climbs like, and bad he weather. Did. In Plataforma de Gredo, stage 20 of the Vuelta 2019. Oh, yeah. But he was at, like, Roglic was letting him there. Yeah. Um, yeah. He was ahead in GC. It's going to be difficult for Pogaccia. I think, I don't know, maybe wait for the Pyrenees? I doubt it. I think I he'll try tomorrow. If there's one GC rider in the peloton that can try something crazy and get away with it, it's Tadej Pogacar. So I'm not writing him off. He's in the battle and he's going to show it at some point. And he's going to take back time to Jonas at some point in his Grand Tour on one stage, in my opinion. But it's going to be really difficult to get 2 minutes 22 back. But hey, the closer we get them together by the end of week 2, the more intense week 3 will be. So I hope for a strike back of Bowie so that they get a bit closer. Yeah, he will definitely try. We'll see what he can do tomorrow, whether Yumbo, if I was them, I would just... Because if Jonas says he feels good again tomorrow, yeah, just train it up on Alp de yep. Wes. And Because I think you need to... I, need, I think you need to kill Ineos too, Benji. Like, you don't want Adam Yates and Thomas and messing around with you as well. But two minutes is a huge gap. Um, but yeah, what a stage in the Tour de France. Yeah, Let but... us know if it's the greatest one you've ever seen. Um, what you don't yep. think... 
you don't think any else can play with them? I don't think any else can play with the amount of people that were in that bloody group up the Galibier for for Jumbo Visma. I think that they've got a team that is insanely strong, and I think based on the current situation, I would project that they go home with green and yellow. But I hope that there's a battle coming from Pogacar's side. I don't expect Thomas to be able to one that can put fire to the legs of Jumbo here. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I don't think any else are going to go down completely without a fight. That being said, I'm sure Thomas, a Tour de France podium, would exceed his expectations before the season. So I think maybe maybe Pogaccio gets caught up in the podium battle and that helps out Jumbo oh. Visma. That could certainly wow. happen as well. If, I, if I'm Pogaccio, I'm getting a, a COVID test and if it's negative tonight, I'll just take my, my pencil and I get a second line on the pencil so I can use that as an excuse. I don't know. Pagach is it was insanely strong today as well. Yeah. I think he can if he yeah, he that what he did on Glibier was crazy. So I just think the the pat the blueprint, sorry, is clear. He just you need to put hours of work into him. If you just attack him straight away, like he's when he's fresh, you're not gonna do anything. Um so you need yeah, to put yeah. hours of work into him with hard pacing. But yeah, what a stage. Like the Tour de France is not over. As I said now many times, Jonas historical performance i think he did granola in like 35 minutes or something 6.15 watts per kilo to altitude completely mental performance um like after the galipier is insane um and we'll see we'll see um i'm i'm still in shock two come on three minutes you can do it (laughs) well yeah Neither of us picked Jonas, so I picked Roglic. Maybe you should get in the break tomorrow. Um, but yeah, what a stage. Anyway, thanks as well for supporting the podcast. Thanks to you all, um, to all the haters and doubters that didn't believe in my my miracle. Um, I was still wrong. Like Jonas took more time than I expected. Um, and don't be surprised if Pogaccio fights back. So yeah, thanks as always, and we'll see you at the pod recap tomorrow. Ciao.